Hi, I'm Jean-Philippe. Um, I'm a guy from Bruges, strange enough. And I'm looking at this, and it, I think it's very nice decorated. I never saw that building like this before, so that's very funny. Um, but it's been a while since I was in Bruges. So I, um, I was raised in Bruges, but now I'm in London. I'm more in London and Chicago and Brussels than I am over here, so, uh, so that's quite funny. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of a little company called Swan Insights. We exist one year and a half, and all of a sudden we have offices in London, in Chicago. We're working in big data, and uh, we are 30 people. And I brought one guy with me who's a lead data scientist. It's called Luik. Hi, everyone. And um, we'll tell a little story about disruptive big data information, so it's quite funny. Besides of being a statistician, I'm also an ornithologist. I like birds. I love birds, that's why we called, our company is called Swan as well, but I'm not going to talk about our company today. You saw in the press today, or the last couple of days, you saw this, there is a black flamingo. Uh, everybody looked at the news, black flamingos, yes. A uh, black flamingo is not a species, a black swan is a species, a black flamingo is just a rare uh, yeah, rare, di rare disease, melanism called, and um, yeah, it's quite funny. He's not discriminated. He's doing all right between uh, everybody. So uh, just to point it out. But what I want to say is we're working with data. Every day we produce data. And a bird is also an animal producing data because we're doing scientific research with them. We ring them and we study migration, behavior, etc. Give you a little story, very short. 20 years ago, Two girls, if you know a girl at the seaside, two girl, girls were doing something bizarre. They were stampeding on the grass, and if you stop at the red light today, have a look, you'll see them as well. They are stampeding and trying to get worms. This never happened before 20, before 20 years ago, and now all the girls are doing that. Very bizarre. And they learn it from each other. New behavior, that's called. Um, and that's what I like to do. I like to connect dots very far away from each other so they have some scientific value but also business value. Yeah, that's a slide for Luik. Well, um, while birds are producing data, um, human is also producing a lot of data. And um, human species is profoundly complex. I mean, as human, we not only travel across seas, but we literally shape the world around us uh, based on a very specific characteristics of human brain that is the the ability to think forward and to conceptually anticipate the future. And this is really interesting because as, as members of human population, what we do is we kind of interact within our own circle of people, defining our interests, defining our actions, and to a certain extent, even defining our future. And while this entire process is obviously driven by random forces and by multiple factors, I believe we just reached a point in history in which it will be possible, thanks to computing power and thanks to science and thanks to this increasing amount of data, to integrate uh, interactions that are taking place within our population. So if you jump into the following slide. Yes, the last two years, 90% of all data was produced, and it's called human data. It's you and I going on Facebook, driving a connected car, uh, getting your spatial data, going to the retailer with your loyalty card, your call data record with your telecom operator, your financial transactional data with your bank. This data has produced, or this type of data has been produced for 90% the last two years. And that's what is happening. All that data is free around, and we can, we can see it, we can investigate it. Of course, we got privacy issues, but we do that on an uh, aggre aggregated uh, way, so, so we don't have those issues. But also, you'll see that at some point, we'll be reaching, a, we call it a data boiling point. What is a data boiling point? A data boiling point is if we don't have data about a specific venue or a specific behavior or about you, we can, there's enough data produced the last couple of years that we can refer and reconstruct that data. So if we have black holes, we can fill them up with 
surrounding data. So that's something new that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Okay? Um, the thing that's happening with all these data is that humans' ability to speak mathematics makes us ready to take full advantage of all the information revealed by all these captors. So this is pretty beautiful first. And then it's a, it's a graph of the Belgian population. Each dot represents an individual, and individual, individuals are connected to each other based on the interaction they share on social media. Next step is to group these people into different clusters, and which is uh, represented by the different colors on the graph. Um, I can tell you, graph theory is nothing new. What is new is the uh, amount of data and the, the quantity of information that can be linked to each connection. And at this point, you probably should be wondering why the hell is this interesting to me? And I can tell you this is a gold mine with countless applications. I'll give you two. Um, the first one of application is just let's, let's start jumping into information characterizing individuals, all the information that you give on your, uh, on your Facebook status on, or on the thing you like. Um, with all this information, it really is possible to kind of target what you're interested in and to find really interesting insights about our Belgian population. For example, let's specific, um, let's target uh, a specific interest for TEDx conferences. Um, so these um, three parts of the graph, so these three parts of the po Belgian population, uh, are um, the parts of the population in which we, sh we saw statistically higher presence of TEDx-related wording in their data. Um, other uh, statistically higher present word um, allowed us to understand that these three parts of the population are indeed the student part of the population, the people from the European Commission, and the artistic people. So it then seemed that um, TEDx, conf TEDx conferences find their most interested audience in these three parts of the population. This is only an example we kind of wrapped up before coming here to, to have yes. a concrete example to show you. Just a little bit more detail. Every dot on that map is a profile, is an individual. This is a combination of all social media. So that means also Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Netflix, you name it. So this is all the information. And you're all connected to each other. And why are we connected to each other? Because when we sociologically assemble or resemble, we go into assemble. So you have clusters in there from two persons, but you have clusters in there from 20,000 uh, uh, persons. And this is the top level for Belgium. In Belgium, we defined 652 clusters. And you really can drive, drill into the cluster and say, OK, I want all the students of the European College in Bruges uh, driving on Monday a Ferrari and playing on Friday golf. So we can go in, into that level of parameters into each cluster. And each cluster has also an ambassador, one or more ambassadors. And those ambassadors are the people who influence more their clusters. This is the easy way to, to explain it because this is, this is calculated by algorithms that we are uh, developing within our own company. But this is, we can do that for every country. So in every country, we can really map, and that's why we say tomorrow there won't be any marketing anymore, but there will be digital sociology. We can parameterize everybody. So we can find people and map them there and say, okay, even if we don't know anything about you, you're part of that cluster, and that cluster is behaving like that with an ambassador, with etc., etc. Okay. Let's now try to go a bit deeper into this information and try to predict future behavior, behaviors of uh, individuals within a population. So this namely is on the next slide. Um, so here we consider, for example, the spread of a technology. So the um, two uh, parts of the graph in which we saw the WhatsApp uh, sign are the two populations in which we saw people starting using uh, WhatsApp technology quite early when it started being available on the market. Uh, what is interesting here is that you can see the yellow cluster and the blue cluster, which is uh, below. Um, the intensity of the connection in the, in the yellow cluster is much more strong than the, uh, than the intensity of the connection in the blue cluster. This means that people, uh, student people, uh, are much more connected, are much, much more interacting 
with each other than people from the blue cluster. And this simple configuration shapes the entire way to which the WhatsApp technology will spread across the population. And you can confidently assume that people from the yellow cluster will adopt WhatsApp technology faster than people from the blue cluster. And going even deeper into the modelization, what you can do is predict the speed, predict the magnitude of this spread. Yes, to give you a more commercial example, um, what is happening, for instance, is what if marketing is starting to use that? What if marketing wants to plug in a new product on a certain market? What if marketing wants to predict customer behavior or lead generation or customer segmentation? So you see it can unleash some power of marketing, not based on the traditional marketing, but based on digital sociology. So these are all new uh, business models that are created based on a total different way of looking at uh, uh, the human data that's created last two years. Well, the thing is that we might not be realizing it right now, but I, I believe humanity is entering a new paradigm that still needs to be defined, but that is definitely new. In Age of Enlightenment, we had this new thinking, this new way of thinking that is every, every event is caused by something. Then we start getting a bit deeper into modelization and we realize, well, it's, it really is difficult to modelize human behavior because initial conditions are every time, every single process different. So it makes it really impossible to make long-term ter long prediction. But I believe with the, with the amount of data and with the amount of information that we are now able to, to, to reveal and to capt with all these captures, we'll be, we, we might be in a way to, to make these long-term predictions. And this really is a new power that humanity is acquiring. But like the old uncle Ben said, for those who saw Spider-Man, a uh, big power comes with big responsibilities, which means that we will, we will need to find the right balance between unleashing the power of data versus entering a big brother society. It really is important for human society to still uh, preserve uh, human's privacy. But on the other hand, you might have all these uh, phenomenal uh, problems that can be tackled through data. Yes. Um. So I don't know if people heard about Nicholas Taleb and the black swan paradigm. Um, if we transpond that to data, all companies today are doing prediction based on BI, business intelligence. And what is business intelligence? It's based on corporate data trying to do predictions. But if you're a customer of Tesco, and they take the corporate data, that's basically the data from their loyalty card. Well, as a customer, you have a life outside that loyalty card. You go shopping to the comp with the competition, you go shopping elsewhere, you etc. etc. You have a cultural background, you have a sociological background, etc. etc. So, what is important over here is I call it a 360 degree. So, before James Cook discovered Australia, everybody thought swans were white. But there's more than that. They haven't looked at Australia because Australia wasn't discovered at the moment. And there are black swans. So that means Tesco's, you have to look outside your loyalty card. You have to look, your customer is more than that. He's got a life outside that. So that's what we mean, is that the last two years, there's 90% of the human data that is produced. You have to have a 360 degree, so you have to take social media, but also open public data Universities publicizing data about you. Governments, organizations are publicizing data about you. The World Health, Health Organization is publicizing data. Uh, we, saw also, we see also that the last two years or the last decades, uh, human population is increasing uh, dramatically. So that these are all important elements that we need to take in order to try and predict and try and to use uh, data in order to make predictions, to make behavior analysis, etc., And that's what we do, that's what we're trying to do, and it's by connecting those dots from, uh, yeah, the other way of looking at, at elements and connecting the dots within your, your company life, your day-to-day -day life, your, your social life, 
that's with that 360 degree that we can make those predictions and we can try to find new business models for our customers, for the companies that we were talking to. And uh, it's the other way of looking at business. And it, they found it very strange, but very opening. And um, that's why with our little company, uh, in one year time, we, uh, yes, we work for companies like Disney, we work for companies like BNP Paribas, so we grow, we grow, and we grow because we have a different way of looking at business. And that's why I encourage everybody to do that. Think out of the box, connect dots far away from each other, and you will find something that nobody else will have found. That's it. Thank you.